Good afternoon. We are calling this regular meeting of the Board of Regents of the Del Mar College District to order at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, March the 7th. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm going to call roll to establish a quorum. I'm going to start with Mr. Cruel over there by himself. <laughs> Dr. Adami. Right here. Mr. Garza. Here. Mr. Loeb. Here. And Dr. Babbley. We have a quorum and can conduct business. We've got a that's a good point, sir. I think that's a good point. <laughs> There's a lot of, lot of weight on your shoulders over there, so we appreciate that. We do have a couple of, uh, three regions who are out today with various work and, and personal commitments, and so um, we will we'll proceed uh, without them today. Um, if you would please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you very much. And Mr. Cruel, with that, would you lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And would you please join us in reading the Del Mar College vision statement? Del Mar College will be the premier choice for life-changing educational opportunities provided by responsive, innovative faculty and staff who empower students to improve local and global communities. Thank you. Del Mar College is streaming our live audio and video from the official Board of Regents meetings on the college's website in real time, with the exception of portions of the meeting considered as closed session by statute. We have an opportunity now for any general public comments for items not on the agenda. Is there anyone for general public comment? I don't see anyone waving their hand, so I think we're in good shape for today. Thank you very much. Oh, we do have one, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. You just thought there was a sign-in sheet. I appreciate that. <laughs> We have an opportunity today to uh, recognize a uh, uh, couple of outstanding uh, work on behalf of both our building and facilities group as well as our financial reporting group. So we're going to start with Mr. John Strybos and talk to us about two design awards that have been won by our uh, architectural team. Uh, did any of that get recording? Do I need to repeat that? All right. <laughs> so now, now we're live. Sorry about that. Uh, didn't push the button. So the General Academic and Music Building has won two design awards from the local chapter of the American Institute of Architects. One design award was selected by a blind jury of eminent architects from Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio. The other is the Mayor's Choice Award, and the architects are here. It's Rick Architects. Ask them to sp speak a few words. You all know my partner, Elizabeth Hugh Richter. I don't have to introduce her. But Your partner of many, many years. In many, yes. <laughs> and, uh, but Aaron Geyser was our project manager for this project and did an incredible job. Uh, we just couldn't be more proud of this building. Uh, we remember clearly the charge we had at the beginning, and we felt like it was a really special opportunity to make a contribution to the historic campus, at the original campus of Del Mar. And, uh, and we, we, we endeavored to do, honestly, more than what the building was asked to do, to be more than just a building, more than just a functional building, but to be some, a place that makes a significant contribution to a campus in, in a way that um, was really long overdue, we feel, and to make outdoor places, to make a building that really stitches a campus together in a, in a significant way. And so it, we're just, we're super proud of it. And whenever we're fortunate enough to have peers recognize what we hope is there in buildings, what we hope we leave behind, it's, uh, it's gratifying. And, it, and it's gratifying to be able to work with uh, 
institutions like Del Mar. And we have kind of a bonus award today. We, 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 the, the moment that brought us here is the two chapter awards. But about a year ago, we submitted the project for a national award uh, with the Brick Industry Association, which is a trade organization. But it's actually a very prestigious award nationally uh, that g gains a lot of participation from, from top architects around the country. And uh, Del Mar uh, Gamby was chosen for for award from the Brick Industry Association. So we have that also. Well, I just want to add to that that I I, uh, I think one of the most rewarding things that we do as architects is to see people love the spaces and places that we help to create, and for them to have a buy-in and an ownership and to build this sense of community. And uh, so we just want to thank you all for the opportunity to to do this. Um, this complex is, is very special to us. Congratulations. Thank you for sharing this with us. I do have to say a special thank you to the taxpayers who in uh, 2014 gave us the opportunity to, to build facilities like this on both our heritage and our Windward campus. Uh, and Dr. Escamilla, to you and your team for leading these efforts. Uh, yes, architects design things, but they do them in this full program of work to make sure that the building uh, is what it needs to be for the campus. Uh, and to have the value added, as you described, Elizabeth, I think is really important for all of us to recognize. It, it, it's been an incredible journey uh, with the Richters and team and Aaron and others. It, it's just been um, so gratifying to look back now well over, really over 10 years ago that we saw this in development. And, and, and you talked about it, it's stitching together the campus in so many ways from the people aspect. It's brought us, brought us to different, um, brought us different space and has given us different uh, di ways to think of uh, educational space differently than we than we have historically uh, I know we had some people really hanging on to those old classrooms and so forth and and uh, I don't even think they remember their old office anymore as a result so anyway thank you all to the Richters and the team and thank you all to the staff absolutely as madam chair said um, thanks for the team to make it uh, to bringing this to fruition thank you thank you Next, we want to offer our congratulations to Mr. Garcia and his team for the GFOA Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Mr. Garcia. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Mr. President, members of the board. Uh, we continue with the same theme about the exceptional work that we do here at the college. Uh, want to congratulate Mr. John Johnson, Dr. Kathy West, uh, Jackie Landrum, Christina Gonzalez, Mike Braden, Melinda Edelman, Monica Benavides, and their respective team members for earning two highly uh, respectable awards for financial reporting uh, from the Government Financial Officers Association. A few uh, tidbits about the GFOA. Uh, their mission is to advance excellence in public finance and assist organizations like ourselves uh, uh, with developing and identifying financial policies and best practices through education, training, and networking. DMC uh, has been awarded the GFOA Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting and the Award for Outstanding Achievement in Popular Annual Financial Reporting for, finan for the fiscal year 2021. I'm going to ask these team members to step up and receive their award. Thank you very much for taking this time to recognize our GFOA achievements. And the business office is very proud of continually uh, reaching the, these goals. And I think it's been 12 years. This is our 12th uh, year, and we're looking forward to number 13. So thank you very much. Congratulations for your continued success. In our student success report today, we will hear from Patricia Benavides Dominguez on our early college programs. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Board of Regents, Dr. Escamilla. Today, uh, we will do a brief overview of early college programs. 
Early college programs uh, has a large service area. We service 47 high school partners in nine counties. Of those 47 high schools, four are designated as early college, and uh, 13 are designated as PTEX, which is Pathways in Technical ed Early College uh, High Schools. And we offer industrial education at nine off-campus sites. This bar graph uh, on the slide shows the total dual credit enrollment by academic year for spring 2023, this current term. Dual credit makes up 29% of the overall college enrollment. Uh, currently, early college program office is on track to exceed our student enrollment numbers from the 21-22 school year. In comparing year-to-year -year data, we are seeing an upward trend, upward trend toward our pre-pandemic numbers. During the 21-2022 uh, academic year, early college programs had 480 school visits. Of those, 315 visits were with high school counselors doing presentations, workshops, advising students, and 165 visits were with high school administrators, superintendents, principals discussing dual credit services and strategic planning for their district needs. Early college program, the early college program team has achieved many accomplishments. We have highlighted a few here on this slide. They are in 2018 early college programs presented at the national um, NASAP uh, conference and have been consistently asked to present many times. In 2019, Early College Programs was uh, featured on the NASAP uh, podcast together with our ISD colleagues from Cal Allen High School. In 2021, received a TA grant in partnership with Educate Texas. In 2022, the team participated in a TACRO uh, panel discussing the current dual credit climate and best practices. And in 2023, the team was asked to participate in a PTEC panel virtual webinar. At this time, I would like to acknowledge uh, Bob Montes and Nicole, would you please stand? And Nicole Kurzinski, Bob Montes is the director for dual credit and uh, Nicole Kurzinski is the assistant director. They both are the conduit that brings ISDs and Dr. Halcom, Dr. Rivera, uh, Dan Kors to make enrollment happen. They are, they are the, they are, there are many moving parts to this program and they do an excellent job. Do I have any? <laughs> any questions? I do have a question. Related to the potential for dual credit scholarships that is in, that was part of the commission recommendations, do you have a sense of, of how many students are not able to take dual credit because of financial obstacles? Do, do we see that scholarship program as being of uh, real value to our students in our service area. Well, Bob, do you want to handle that? Because I, I have an answer, but... Uh. <laughs> well, yes, I do think that, that in some circumstances, uh, there are students that can't, can't access dual credit because of, of the fee. $99 <laughs> could be a lot for some, and, uh, and plus the book, right? If they're having to buy an access code fee or a textbook. Right, some, some courses are more expensive than others, the ancillary costs associated with that course. Uh, and some school districts provide uh, assistance with that, some do not. Some do a mix, you pay and then we'll reimburse. So yes, I do think that if that were to come through, uh, they would be, uh, provide more access to education. Anything more? We're good? Right. Other questions from other regions? Yeah, I, I had a question. Um, I, I noticed you guys do uh, administrator and counselor outreach, which is incredibly important. What kind of outreach do we have towards uh, trustees of the school districts? Because I've noticed since I've started, I, I don't see the awareness of the program amongst 
some of the trustees, and I'm not saying that this is your guys' job, it may be our job. Um, actually, it probably is our job, but do you guys have much contact with the trustees or is it just strictly administrator and counselor level? Typically, it's the administrator, the superintendent level. We do, uh, in, when we've had, uh, most recently we had an event at our, here, Osa Creek, where we invited uh, ISD administrators and superintendents, and we encourage them to bring any board members, but you know it's up to them. Okay. And uh, so, no, I wouldn't say we we do that actively. What, what I, there's the bill, I guess, is is presented in a way where I mean I think the state is telling us we want you guys to do more of this. What do you see as the obstacles of us doing more of it? Well. I think access to students. I okay. think that there are uh, some high schools where there could be more participation. Every high school is different. Every high school has an agenda. And sometimes the students in most need of, uh, of getting access to higher education are either not interested or they're not aware or they're not made aware. So there, there are some challenges with, uh, I would say, marketing to those students. Okay. I mean, I, I, I would say, I, I think with the bill, I think it would help us to kind of, at our level, engage with the trustees at the, at the high schools to try to um, get them more understanding mm -hmm. what the benefits are. Because I mean, I, I saw that and I was like, whoa, you know, I mean, because for what I understand of what the definition of educationally disadvantaged is, it's basically the state offering to pay for an associate's degree or a P-TECH degree from us mm -hmm. for 70 to 80% of the students in our area. So, I mean, you know, theoretically, we if, if everybody took advantage of that, our campuses would be high schools rather than, you know, our, I mean, we, we can get most of our work done before they're even out of high school. So. Yeah. And, and that is our goal, to um, have them exit high school with a credential of some kind. And I do agree with your, your statement that we need to bring, not our goal to in bringing the superintendents and other top administrators is because they might not be aware of all the improvements that have taken place on all our campuses. So that is, they've, when we've brought them and seen our, our the new renovations, they've been most impressed. and. I think that has led to more awareness and enrollment. Do, do we have a, um, I know in some cases we teach on campuses, in other cases the students come to our campus, and that can be kind of dependent on what the demand is for that individual class. Um, when they need to be, tran when they need to get to our campus, do they handle transportation themselves does the school district or does rta ever run a bus for them or anything like that the only way they access rta services and they are allowed to with with a, a del mar student id okay most times when uh we there are organized classes or sections or they're mixed in with everyone uh the school district provides the bus so in most cases, probably I would say the majority of the students that ride on their own are probably the homeschool students and maybe the few students that they may not be taking a career in tech course where there's a, a, a full classroom coming on a bus. So like for instance, we have Ray High School students come here and since the proximity from Ray to Del Mar East Campus, they'll come on their own, take a couple of classes and then go back to the high school. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from other regents? Thank yes. you. Don't have a question, more of a comment, if you will. I attended one of the workshops or one of the presentations they did over at GP. And I had planned on going to the one at Veterans, Veterans but High something, School. something came up and I couldn't make it. But the presentation that they give and the uh, options that they give them in terms of tables, out at, at, they did it at least at Great Report and it was fantastic. The interest was, was level was high. I just I just think that, like David was saying, we have to figure out a way. And we're starting to have conversations with some of the trustees at CCISD, and I'm going to continue that work. But we've got to be able to figure out a way to get into the classrooms. And even in the conversations that I've had with staff, is that sometimes the administrators or the counselors don't are ready to give up. 
access to the classrooms and in order to reach those students that are more likely to be able to come to our campus and finish up their work if they've started we have to reach the students at the classroom level because those are the students that are not talking about college on their dinner table that do not get pushed to go to to workshops like the ones that we put on and those are the ones that will benefit most by being able to save on the tuition rates by being able to pay for dual credit classes versus and if they can't afford it the question related to how would we get money for scholarships for those students at least it would be raised and we can do something from our level college level and the ISDs in order to be able to help those students and those are the ones that are going to be make the biggest impact in our community because they're more likely to stay and to go somewhere else thank you thank you but to, to Mr. Loeb's point, the state clearly, through the work of the commission, is prioritizing or, or, or providing great uh, emphasis on dual credit programs and our opportunity to expand those programs. So I'm, I'm saying this to reiterate to the, the folks that are here, maybe don't hear discussions at this level all the time, that this is an area where we know we can grow, we know we have opportunity, and, and then potentially after uh, September 1st of this year we'll have money to put behind it as well in terms of expanding those programs the state is going to start um, counting or giving us um, uh, completion points and in, in, in around the, the outcomes related to dual credit so there's there's great emphasis but there's also great support for that so I think we've got, got some great opportunity in front of us absolutely sir so I'd like to just add to that I'd like to thank the Board of Regents present and past for sustaining our our momentum and our commitment to both um, to all dual credit students let's just say that throughout the service area okay we have sustained that um, that model of $99 per class for all students and we knew that one day or we believed we should say we believed one day that that would change and conversations uh, of the strains that 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 commitment has put on this college has paid off over the generations now now it's been a, it's a couple of generations of students that we're talking about that have come through and so because of this board and because of its commitment to such um, um, an important transformation of our local education for our students um, we are going we are positioned in a an absolutely fantastic way to with the, with the work of the commission and so forth going forth and the, and the commitment from the state to advance dual credit like never before. So I just have to say thank you to this Board of Regents and, and, and those who came before on this board uh, for that level of support. It, it is transforming education in our community. I, I just want to say also that I, I think it, uh, it takes, um, we have a, um, the academic area Instruction area has a great reputation that we would be in nine counties as you could see on the map Many far outside of our service area, and I think that's a testament to uh, our academic instruction Thank you very much for that report appreciated Moving on to Regents report I uh, wanted to report to the Board of Regents that uh, I have made appointments to our audit committee uh, per our bylaws our audit committee is the one standing committee we have the board can choose to create additional committees and we might have some discussion around that at our retreat uh, in April but uh, for the time being uh, the appointments to the audit committee are as follows Mr. Garza will chair uh, myself Dr. Adami and Mr. Cruel will also serve on the audit committee so uh, reporting that to the board uh, moving on to our college president's report thank you madam chair I'll be brief I have a few items I'd like to talk about on February 16th uh, if you were fortunate to attend, um, I apologize for the frostbite that you probably got during the police training academy groundbreaking that was just out here to our west of our campus. A cold front blew in that day, and whew, let me tell you what, it made it a memorable occasion. But I want to uh, thank everybody, uh, regents and staff members who attended um, this. It was an important, it, this is an important public public partnership with our city uh, to advance. Uh, police training not only in the city but in the region uh, above and beyond uh, above and in partnership and beyond with what we are doing already at the Windward campus and so we look forward to um, seeing that come to fruition I just saw the, the, the construction barriers be, uh, being installed yesterday 
Um, and uh, so things are moving forward on this very, very nice facility that's going to be coming, and, and uh, it's just going to be phenomenal. Uh, on February 21st and 22nd, uh, Dr. Leonard Rivera and I both attended the Board of Trustees Institute uh, and workshop um, in uh, Lakeway, Texas, which is just outside of Austin. Uh, we presented, we were asked to, pre to present. And I, and I know Dr. Leonard didn't have time, and hmm, I kind of didn't either, but we were, it was really, really important that we were there to participate and present on our model for, uh, Del Mar College's model for continuing education and advancing uh, those types of programs. Other trustees were very, very interested in what we were doing, and, and so we attended and presented there. Um, concurrently, uh, as, as was planned, the Texas Association of Community Colleges monthly meeting uh, was also um, attached to that by calendar and in location, and so I was able to attend that. Y you don't hear about a monthly meeting very often. That, that's a, a, ch a change that the new administration of TAC has brought on during the legislative session. Instead of quarterly, because of the session, we've, we, we've changed to more now monthly meetings so that we can stay abreast of, of all the things that are going on uh, at the ledge and how they change um, quickly. Um, that concludes my report, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Dr. Escamilla? Thank you. Seeing none, we'll move on to our staff reports. Um, so starting with uh, one of our first discussions around the strategic planning effort that will, be, that will befall us over the next several months. Uh, Ms. Keyes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Regents. Appreciate being able to be here this, this afternoon. As we begin to focus on the future of the college and the strategic planning process, we look to our mission statement and the key concepts that it represents. The information and data that you will see today provides the highlights of each of these areas. These factors are broken into four key areas. The economy of the region and the state, the characteristics of the population within the service area, trends in higher education, and finally, as Dr. Villarreal presented last month to the Board of Regents, the impact of the actions of the 88th Legislature and the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. The information and data comes from a variety of sources, such as the Corpus Christi Regional Economic Development Corporation, professional studies that they created and prepared, the Port of Corpus Christi, census reports, Lightcast, which is formerly EMSI, which is the economic modeling company who the state of Texas and most colleges and universities in the state use. Uh, student Clearinghouse, the Coordinating Board, and others. Texas is the ninth largest economy in the world, larger than Canada, Korea, Russia, and Australia. And we all benefit from this. As we begin to look at the workforce, we want to look at the Texas workforce, which is comprised of over 14.6 million people. And significant to our region, number one in job creation and the largest energy producer in the nation. As we look more to our region, though, in the MSA of Aransas, San Patricio, and Nueces counties, you see the trend lines for the unemployment rates follow in sync with the state and nation. However, our local MSA is staying approximately 1% point higher in comparison. This information that you're going to see today is provided by the Corpus Christi Regional Economic Development Corporation and shows the region as it relates to the industrial complexes and the over $57 billion in investment in most recent years. And I'd like to call attention to the list of the companies just down that, that slide right there. You see who the college is dealing with and the business and industry that we're connecting with. Ms. Keyes, may I interject and just ask sure. a question? And I know it's speculation, but I hear quite often when I, when I see this 57 yeah. billion, how far out is 100 billion? Not very far. Within the next five years, five to seven years is what I'm hearing. It's a total 100 billion. Uh, the next slide, we have a slide from the port that's going to show more than 57 as okay. of right now. Any thunder, I apologize, but yeah, that's that, okay. I, I really want to make that, emphasize that to the Board of Regents as we prepare for our next strategic plan and for all our faculty and staff who are out there. 
remember the day, for those who were here, when there was a $1 billion investment, and we were so excited mm -hmm. for the $1 billion, and we, we still are grateful, but you get my point. Yes. Thank it, you. This is a huge number, and a huge number on our coastline. I think this slide, just to go off script here, it shows the, the port and the region, and, and of course, as you go out into the Gulf of Mexico and the deepening of the port and all that the impact's going to have is, is just huge. This is an important slide uh, as you begin to digest what we're showing today. As we look at jobs, the jobs were directly related to COVID in 2020 and continued to rebound in the region and are projected to continue over the next years. I think it's pretty dramatic as you see the drop off from 2019 to 2020. As we look at the largest employers by number of employees in our region, government and healthcare are the highest followed by construction and retail. I'd like to point out that the hash mark shows where Texas, where our MSA stands with against the national average within the jobs in those categories. However, as we consider the relationship of population by location of our MSA compared to the state, the industrial sector of mining, quarrying, and oil and gas, or energy, is the most impactful, and it pays the highest wages. The college has programs to support all of these areas that are listed, and we're very proud of that. This is an example of the types of companies and jobs that are either presently coming to the region or working with our Economic Development Corporation to come here. Green energy is showing interest and the area has been designated as a hydrogen hub. This will be an emerging industry and the college is already exploring how that can impact our programs. As you know, Tesla recently announced a over $400 million lithium battery facility to be built in Nueces County. During the public meetings in Robstown, one of the Tesla engineers mentioned that, uh, that one of their main reasons for selecting Nueces County was the process technology program at Del Mar College. We're pretty proud of that too. <laughs> The college's technical and workforce programs monitors information such as this to align programs with jobs by sector. The similarity of jobs such as mining, construction, transportation, education, and health services, leisure, and hospitality are all ex excellent examples of the programs that we presently have. And you see the number of jobs that are out there in those different sectors. The Corpus Christi Regional Economic Development Corporation engaged a professional consulting group called Newmark and working with Dr. Lee at Texas A&M Corpus Christi to conduct various surveys of the regional business and community leaders. The 2022 Business Retention and Expansion Report that this references shows that 29% were at risk of losing high value employees and are still, are still dealing with the impact of COVID-19 on the workforce. Additionally, the report identified the top jobs in demand and, these, and the college has programs in all of these areas that you're seeing, except we don't focus on general laborers. But if you look at all the other key terms up there, we have programs in every one of those areas. CCREDC also conducted a survey that showed the three top areas that business and industry leaders listed as needing assistance. The number one employee training programs was employee training programs followed by grant funding for specialized workforce training. The college provides programs directly tied to in-demand job listings of the Texas of the Workforce Solutions of the Coastal Bend and Texas Workforce Skills Development Grants to employers. The college's corporate services and career technology programs work directly to provide these types of programs to train employees and its state funding. These services will continue in the future as we partner with CCRDC and others. And I think this slide is, up, is reinforcing that upstill coastal bend and our, uh, the relationship that we have with all these industry partners. 
The targeted industry study by Newmark identified similar workforce needs that aligned with our programs in the UAS drone and emerging areas of advanced manufacturing, steel and metal fabrication, recycling, and green manufacturing. It also highlighted the college's process technology program is supporting chemical processing and refining. In, view, in reviewing the needs to develop a strong workforce, the concept of lifestyle and quality of place for attracting skilled and professional workers was identified. Del Mar is a key st stakeholder in the survey and is mentioned as providing training and many of the supporting programs that address the needs of families and community. The Port of Corpus Christi is a driver of the regional and national economy as the number one exporter of crude oil and in annual revenue tonnage. The port accounts for over 98,000 related jobs and more than 38% of the area's labor force. And we presently have MOUs in our conducting training with the Port of Corpus Christi. And here's the next slide at $65 billion. The port is tracking over $65 billion in capital investments by companies shown on this slide. This includes over $12 billion in direct foreign investment. I'm going to let that settle for a minute to look at all those neat names and uh, logos. It's very impressive, those of us that have been here for the last many years, to see the companies that are coming in in relationship to what's going on with the port. The economy is contingent in many ways of a skilled workforce. The college has programs in these areas and as you, as you see, support the overall quality of life aspect in the community, which indirectly plays a role in attracting and maintaining a strong workforce, as was shown by the surveys conducted by the CCREDC. As you look down this list of uh, titles of jobs and in-demand skills, Del Mar has every one of those programs too, except housekeeping. So. As we look at the college's service area comprised of the five counties of Aransas, San Patricio, Nueces, Kennedy, and parts of Clayburg, population trends emerge. Since 2017, Hurricane Harvey, the population growth in the region has remained basically flat with a slight decrease at approximately 500,000 people. You can see the trend lines there. As we review the MSA of Nueces, San Patricio, and Aransas counties, the combined population of over 446,000 saw a slight decrease by 1.5% after Hurricane Harvey. Interestingly, closely aligned migration of people moving from San Patricio County to Nueces County and actual reversed occurred. And we can track that number almost to the same. One can only surmise that individuals moving to be closer to their jobs created a large part of this change. Can we stop right there for a second? I want to yes. understand the population trends. So yes. overall though, the MSA, which is not exactly, does, it does not match our service area. Um, but the MSA has lost 500,000? Oh, no. The 500,000 is the total service area population. Okay. okay. Tell, yeah. I, was, I heard yeah. then, I heard that incorrectly. So I may have said it wrong. But, yeah, our total service area of the four and a half counties is right at 500,000. 500, yeah, I was yeah. trying to understand yeah. those numbers. I was like, that doesn't make sense. But we have declined. And so mm -hmm. yes. what, what do we owe the decline to? Not the in and out of... Because an in and out of San Patricio and Nueces County wouldn't cause our MSA population to decline. No. Do we have um, our demographers or anybody? What are the smart people saying about the cause of that? They're tracking it back to Hurricane Harvey, which hit 2017. And of course, most of the numbers track back five years. So that's your five year window. And then also, when you throw in COVID 19 and the impact on the workforce and families, you had people leaving the area to find jobs in different areas. I think part of what they're also not capturing is the uh, workers that are working specifically with our big industrial partners yeah. in construction, where we saw 2,000, 5,000 
workers at a time on site in San Patricio County, but they weren't permanent residents and probably not captured in census, census well, reports. There, there is a large out migration once a project like Gulf Coast Growth Ventures is finished, which was had two or 3,000 people working over there at a time. And those guys are moving on to the next big project somewhere else. The same way with Chenier and, and a lot of the others. As the project's complete, those guys move on. And so that may be a good portion of that decline. Yes, sir. I think so. That's really what they're showing is that this influx of people, of course, they're not captured in your census, in your census recounting either. So. Anything related to, uh, to the um, concerns about the correctness of the census data? I think so. Uh, in fact, this, a lot of the census data we're getting is preliminary, and they're still uh, working on the census data. There, I mean, there, there's some concern about the census data, yes. but there, there has been, there has been softening in the overall economy in the last four or five years compared to the ten years prior to that. Um, and so, I think some of it's the, con the the pace of construction is not as intense. The oil field is not. I mean, we we in the mid teens we had this. You know, if you could pick up a shovel, you could make. $70,000 a year kind of thing. And so that softened significantly, but then, I mean, there, there's not been the, the private spending or the private activity that there was 10 years ago. The, I, I think the city issued 10 commercial building permits last year for new structures. So, and that includes nonprofit and schools and stuff like that. So there's been a lot of softening. Okay. For, we'll move on to population. Uh, this is beginning to look at characteristics of our population. When we consider the characteristics of the population in the coastal bend, it is evident that over 20% or approximately 91,000 are millennials between the ages of 25 to 39. 27% or approximately 125,000 are 55 years old or older and could retire soon. Racially, racial diversity is considered to be high as compared to the nation, and the number of veterans is higher at almost 32,000 individuals. And so those are the unique characteristics or traits that we are thinking about as we develop our programs. And I wanted to mention that uh, as you're looking at the millennials, this ties back quite a bit to the study of quality of place that the Corpus Christi Regional Economic Development Corp did with their experts to determine how do we keep people to attach and stay here, which is always an issue. And we look at the population overview, the population is more evenly balanced at a close to 50-50% regarding the number of males and females here in our region. However, earnings per job, if you look at the earnings, the earnings per job were over $15,600 below the national average. So our average earnings right at $64,000, and that's 50, over $15,000 less than the national average. As we consider the makeup and needs of our community and population, CCREDC conducted a survey to determine the level of attachments of the citizens to the region, meaning why do people stay here? Three of the key areas of recommendation centered around economic offerings combined with place connectedness, social offerings, and aesthetics plus community assets. The college's new Oso Creek campus was mentioned in the survey with findings as an example of economic offerings plus place connectedness. This recognized the culinary programs and a sense of place that the campus brings to the south side of Corpus Christi. Thought we might want to take pride in that. At almost 92% of the college students in the age group of 19 to 39, which co closely compares to the age group of 18 to 34 demographics in the study, we want to look at the comparison as it relates to the college. 
The survey in the coastal bend identified key qualities of lifestyle important to this age group. Professional development activities, walkable communities, and social, act, social uh, offerings were among them. Now we're gonna begin looking at trends in education. As we begin to review the trends in the Coastal Bend and our MSA, we show that educational attainment is almost 7% below the national average, with 13.9% having a bachelor's degree and 8.8% .8 an associate's degree. It is also noted that nationwide community colleges enrollment dropped almost 10% due to COVID-19. And this graph shows more detail as to how educational attainment breaks down within our MSA. If you notice the different ranges and the percent of population, and again, that's for our three county area. Nationally, women now make up 60% of the college population with males stopping out or not attending. And the student population at Del Mar College closely mirrors the same numbers. A concerning trend was presented by Dr. Jim Lee of Texas A&M Corpus Christi in referencing the disconnected youth since COVID-19 that has increased in our MSA more than the state average. Disconnected youth are defined as not in school and not working. This group represents 19% of youth between the ages of 16 to 24 and is considered to be on an upward trend. This is normally the age group that is building human capital through education and workforce training to generate higher wages in life. And additionally, more students are present living in poverty. That's within our own community. So as we look to the future, we can look to our services and how do we address the needs of this group of students. As the February, at the February board meeting um, and is today, Mary McQueen will follow me in presenting an update on the 88th legislature. And as you know, the impact on the Commission on Community College Finance will hopefully come to fruition this session. Dr. Villarreal provided an update on the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board Strategic Plan, Building a Talent Strong Texas, last month. And our presentation today is the next step in providing information in our own strategic planning process. In summary, the data and information will set the stage for the next visioning and planning sessions over the next year. Some of the key takeaways from this information is listed here for your consideration. I think the top one is the economy is growing in the region and the state of Texas. Uh, job growth and in-demand skills are tied to workforce demands. And we continue to need to focus on program growth that is connected to workforce. Uh, population growth varies within our service area. And that sense of place is important to our students and particularly in the millennial age group. And the diversity of our student population is representative of the community as a whole. Any questions at this point? Yeah. Um, I don't know really how to phrase this question, but did any of these folks, Dr. Lee and any of the others, uh, get a sense that in the community in the region there's starting to be a lot of pushback towards the, the bigger industries I mean I, I, I get that just get that feeling that there are a lot more people out there that are are pushing back from the development of another Gulf Coast Growth Ventures or or you know what are, whatever and I, I guess my basis of that is uh, I, I do some work for the city of Ingleside and uh, there was quite a bit of pushback over a couple of projects that were proposed in the Ingleside area by the, by the residents. So there's not anything in any of the reports that show that, but I think the fact that they did this the study on quality of place and looking at life quality of life issues um, put, provided a lot of data as to what people are looking for in the environment and how important our clean environment is. But there's no hard data that I found. 
I think Aransas Pass flat out said no to an industrial project. So, I mean, the things I'm hearing is that there's kind of a, there's a strategic discussion about a bunch of the land between Ingleside and Aransas Pass, kind of that triangle of Ingleside, Aransas Pass, and Portland, that they've kind of run out of space that doesn't have all the infrastructure already. And so they're having a discussion over there, kind of saying, well, do you guys even really want this? And if you do, who's going to pay to put in all the infrastructure needed for more growth? And I think there's a parallel discussion on trying to pull some of that um, over here. And I know the EDC is working on asking the city for some money to do uh, green and um, low water use type industrial <coughs> recruitment. Um, because I think they are seeing some of that where people want to see us diversify a little bit more. So. That's what I've heard. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Yes, sir. So what, what's your view on nursing shortage and teacher shortage, and how is Del Mar responding to it? Or, or just give me some ideas. What, Excellent what's what's going on in yep. that question? Yeah. Thank you. And as you noticed <laughs> on one of the slides, nursing was one of the top jobs in demand yep. right now in our area, even higher than in the state. Right now, Del Mar College has an associate's degree in nursing, and we have a bachelor's degree in nursing. Uh, we have an, an excellent program in nursing. And we work with all three of the regional hospitals to provide uh, clinicals, and we're on site. So Del Mar is responding, actually, in all the allied health areas. So. Teaching uh, shortage, I mean, teacher shortage. Our teacher um, shortage is more of a transfer program uh, to A&M Corpus Christi. And so it's handled through the academic side, but we do have the transfer program. My comments are related to the three slides in the trends in education section. Um, the, um, the fact that our educational attainment is below the national average, and really the middle slide that shows us 30% have a high school diploma and 24% have some college but not a degree. And I realize a certificate may or may not be included depending on how they collect data. But that tells me that 54% of our population is our target market. Um, I'm, I'm curious, and, and the reason I want to I, I want to <clears throat> talk about this is do we need to really dig into those population groups, whether it's hiring a demographer to help us really understand the trends um, amongst those age groups and what's still coming down the pike? Do we need to do some better market research about who those folks are, how to reach them with the right messaging? We, we know we have the quality programs. Mm -hmm. How do we connect them with the right programs? And so I'm, I'm curious if, if we, I think we really need to dig in as a board uh, as we're setting these priorities for the next strategic plan to understand that group and, and how that group is evolving over the next five to ten years and what do we need to do to connect to them many of those opportunities will come with strategies that we've already begun to employ and we'll be deploying here pretty soon here at the college we have a couple of efforts out there um, two unique um, partnerships with a couple of outside organizations that we're going to bring to you all to discuss um, how we're reaching out to this age population that's already been to the college and has stopped out for one reason or another. And again, these are just two different uh, unique strategies. And so uh, we'll have certainly some, some catalysts to, to kick off that conversation and some really interesting data um, with, some, with some efforts that we have and some partnerships with some external organizations that um, help us reach what we'll call the low-hanging fruit. Again, the, the, the numbers are, are, are fairly steady for the past couple of decades. I mean, that's, that's the, the, the good, only good news about that is that, we, is that we understand it and we can see it. Um, and I think what's different now than what's been different over the past is, and I can tell you that it's very different from when I started here, or in early, uh, well, in 2008, in, in 2008, 9, and 10, in that the fact that we're talking about a 500,000 population, a population of 500,000 as opposed to the, the 337,419, you know, that number, um, is very different. And so the opportunities for this college 
are then part of our, the more that that's a part of our conversation, mm -hmm. the better strategies we can employ. So we're gonna have some very micro level kinds of things, some very, uh, very specific kinds of things uh, that we're gonna be talking about. And then I, lo I love how we're setting the stage to really just make it a part of our conversation that it is the MSA. And then with distance ed, it even goes beyond mm -hmm. that. So it, I, want, I want to challenge us, to, sure. if, the, if the numbers haven't moved significantly, then are we really doing the work we need to do in that high school diploma, some college group? Uh, and, and if it's MSA versus service area, let, let's, de let's determine what definition and what population base, because going back and forth between the two or by county, uh, may or may not be helpful, so let's determine what population base we want to talk about and let's really dig in and challenge ourselves to say what kind of difference can we make in the future. We've ridden along and we've not had significant, you know, our, our high enrollment watermark, we almost reached the high enrollment watermark in fall of 2019 in terms of just that credit hour, and that was, but that was also our unduplicated headcount high watermark or close sure. to high watermark. Sure. We know what happened with COVID, but getting back to that point and going above that point, because we've got to bring, we've got to be bringing people in, connecting them to programs to get the outcomes that we want. So I, I just, I think we really have to challenge ourselves to say, what are we doing? How are we measuring ourselves? What resources do we need to understand it? What do we need to do differently, better, stronger, faster, friendlier? I don't know, but, but let's challenge ourselves to come up with those answers as a body together um, so that we're we're all we're all in that together. I, I think also to frame these conversations, we need to look at um, some of the frameworks that we use in in research and so forth. We need to start off with problem statements and those kinds of things. Y you call it context, and 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 mm -hmm. so forth, um, because we have multiple problems that we're looking at. And I think when you start there and work your way back, I go back to my training. Uh, in research and the, my experience in research rather uh, graduate school and that sort of thing and, and right away you know I can identify multiple problems I think if we think in those terms then we're all on the same page and then talking about um, um, pinpointing um, the various populations you know then we have our unique aspects of, of what's going on here with with the transformation and I think this is a big part of what's going on education is changing the population is changing, especially across the state, and particularly particularly here at Delmar College, in Delmar College District, and that is the, the age is dropping for a reason. And it's dropping, but we stay the same. And what, what we keep the same lenses and saying, where's the population? Where's the population? Well, it's growing. Well, we're not paying attention to the dual credit students. I mean, we're, we're, we're serving them, but where is this population? We need to understand why that's happening and then really reflect on ourselves uh, as an institution and what our mission really is. What is the problem there? Where's the problem statement there? Is there a problem? Are there two problems? Uh, and so forth. Uh, we look forward to those conversations. Um, setting the context and setting the backdrop with, with this sort of data is what this is all about, Regents. And it's why, it's why we bring it forth to, to prepare ourselves just to kind of Again, catalyzed thoughts as we get ready to take deep dives in, in retreats and, and, and deeper workshop fashions in the future. I've got just a couple of comments. And I think the messaging is going to be, I mean, it needs to be different. It can't be all the same. I think that the group that I'm most concerned about are those students that you're talking about that, that aren't doing anything between 18 and 24 years old. That's a huge human capital disconnected. that we're not it, and, they, and they disconnected they probably disconnected coming out of elementary school when they quit being cute to their parents but we need to figure out how we're going to reach those I think some of the ills or some of the challenges we have related to improve the percentage of kids or students that attain some sort of certification or or associate's degree I think we're going to be able to improve that number with the expansion that we have in the dual credit efforts right because some of those get to take care of some of their, their credit hours in high school, it's going to be an easier chore, chore to be able to, to, to finish up, even if it's a year, year and a half out. Those students that disconnect, that don't see any hope of doing college credit, those are the ones, like I said, I think the, uh, 
ones that we need to reach. I think it's not all bad. If you look at our MSA numbers, yes, some we lost because some communities didn't get rebuilt uh, after uh, Hurricane Harvey, and so we lost a, a certain population in, in in our in our area or service area. But I think that it's not as bad as the number could have been had it not been for all the opportunities, that we, economic op development opportunities that we've had in our region. I think that it's also good that we've developed programs and have programs for people, to, young, young kids, to be able to take advantage of those opportunities that come in the new industrial investments in our area. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you'd have people coming in, and we'd have a big, huge bubble of a population growth, and then those construction jobs go away, and they'd be left with 100 jobs versus the 2,000 it took to build a project. So you'd see these, these big bubbles that are hard for us to manage as a community, both in housing and in, 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 in human um, uh, skills, uh, I'm saying keeping them employed in terms of employment uh, issues. So I think, again, we're going to be able to fix those issues with some of the stuff we're already doing with some additional funding that comes from the state to be able to expand some of those programs. We need to figure out how we're going to fill the gaps in order to be able to make sure that we can develop the human capital we need in order to make sure that those local talent is taking advantage of the economic opportunity. Re Regent Garza, about yeah. a, a while back when the Eagleford shale was on its way, and, and because everybody could pick up a shovel and, 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 and do as Regent Loeb talked about, uh, and go make a really good living and doing some basic labor and just jumping in because of the hyper, the need of the hyper market of, of employment for, for, for the construction aspects, we were cautioned. We were cautioned by, um, some of the leaders out there in the petrochem world, they said, but we need you all to change what y'all are doing and focus on the long haul. Focus, there's a hundred year supply of gas and petrochem that we've identified right now. We know there's more beyond that, but you've got to focus on the long haul jobs mm -hmm. because what's, yes, you can, you can, we can never have enough welders. We can never have enough of, of, of those positions that eventually evolve, frankly, into other jobs. Um, but what they've, what they, what, when they warned us, we shifted our curriculum, largely in the in the, in the uh, uh, industrial programs, to prepare for those long hauls. Because if you look back at that slide that talked about the number of jobs, I'm I'm touching my slide, my screen like it's going to move. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm like the little baby with the iPad trying to make everything move. Um, when you talk about the number, it's, uh, there's hundreds of jobs, not thousands. Uh, where is it? The available locally. When you talk about it, uh, we, we, uh, there's another one. There's another slide. Yes, right there. Right there. Yeah, right there. I mean, you're, you're, now that there's there's that's a significant number right there. That's a significant number. Um, but those are the jobs that we 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 that we prepared for was the hundreds of permanent jobs first, and those are your process technology, your millwright, your. Um, instrumentation as well as your mm -hmm. welding and, and non-destructive technology those kinds and that's what they warned us to do and we prepared that because they said the temporary jobs are going to go away yeah. and yes you can add to that and yes you can help with that contract training short terms and that sort of thing but you've got to be thinking about that long haul and I think we are well positioned in that regard to to use the term I think our friends over at Gulf Coast Growth Ventures used the term the steady eddies and the steady eddies mm -hmm. Uh, uh, for the workforce that would come there, work there, and make a career there. Okay, that's not the complete story, but that is that was part of our history and part of our preparation mm -hmm. for just what you were talking about. And I think the college has done a remarkable job in getting ready for that as well. The other issue is that you, you mentioned some of those students or some of those um, yeah, young people that, that are living below the po poverty level mm -hmm. between 18 and 24 years old. Right. And again, as you get them reconnected, right, into dual credit or into skills training, and they start filling some of the jobs that are being created, then that poverty level issue is going to be reduced or go away. Right. And so I think some of the problems are going to be fixed if we continue to do our job the way we know we, know we need to do it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I've got a couple comments. You know, I, I, I don't want you all to sell yourselves short because I, in, in getting ready to lobby the state on HB8, I went and looked at some of the census data, and if you look at our educational attainment by age bracket, 
over 25, we have a much lower college, some college and above. Uh, and I only looked for Corpus Christi. I didn't look for the whole MSA or the whole service area. It, it's much lower than the state average 25 and above. Under 25, we're much higher than the mm -hmm. state average. And I think that that kind of bears out in some of the conversation we hear from business, which is people saying, well, I can't find anybody. And you know, one of the thoughts I have is that I think we need to start engaging the businesses a little more and saying, okay, what kind of what kind of educational benefits are you giving people who work for you? Because this may be that, you know, we're at the point where you need to hire entry level people and pay for them and provide the flexibility for them to come here and get the training you need for the end job you want them for. Um, you know, the the era of you can find somebody who is eminently qualified and already has, you know, the skills may be over. We, we may be out of those people. Um, but I, I would say I, I agree. I think we need to do an assessment on, you know, who are we reaching, who are we not reaching. Um, I, I also think that um, I'd, I'd love to see some feedback from our our working groups in each program about what they think those programs need in terms of is there equipment that they need because in some ways this is a plan on what we want to do but it should be a, a very good analysis of where we are on everything so we can you know so if somebody's saying well you know your nursing program you need more we can come back and say well yeah but everybody's saying that you know we need this piece of equipment or we need more clinical space or whatever it is in each one of those so we have a game plan going forward coming out of our strategy session on these are the things that we need to to find in order to give people what they want in terms of the feedback i also think that uh, we need to get more involved in the edc I, lenora does a fantastic job but i mean it, it's we're we're what we do is number one or number two on the feedback they get and so um i think uh, participating on a higher level with them uh, I think would be beneficial to us because it looks like you know people are talking to them but if the number one thing they're asking for is what's training you know maybe we need to have one of our person one of our people there every day on those calls in the meetings and that's a full-time job for somebody um, and so I, I think we should look at that um, I know that advanced manufacturing, um, that's a significant, I think, I, I heard it was a thousand welders full time for that. So I mean, that that's level of we're going to, we need to gear up. Uh, they, I, yeah, I think of, of that, of that, so it, it says two, one of them is, one of them is smaller. I think. The bigger one is 2,000, and I think half of the people are welders for that 2,000. Um, the lithium refining, that I mean, that's happening. They've announced they've broken ground. They have a construction manager. They're doing it. So um, I mean, I, I think the earlier we can be involved in those conversations, the better for us. And I think, um, but like we, were, like we were saying earlier, I think getting as much of this done in high school as possible and getting them engaged and figuring out how to get um i i was at a i was at a breakfast last week and i talked about hp8 and everybody was you know and it was business people rudy wasn't there that day but it's you know his group and uh they said you know oh that's great you know it's wonderful that's awesome and they got to a trustee at a high school and they started talking about well, we're going to go out and they started naming all these things and everybody jumped on the trustee saying, well, Delmar already does that. Why are you guys duplicating services? So that's kind of why I'm on this new kick of, you know, we need to engage with those people because I, I think what we, we got to grab those people and drag them into the tent that already exists because I think there's a pretty good tent, but I think it kind of stops at us and doesn't go lower. And I think that's what, what Rudy's saying is we need to, we need to go lower. You know, we need to be able to get eighth grade seventh grade early high school and really engage them uh because i think we are losing a lot of people we we've we've you're, you're absolutely right and and we have been pushing that conversation at the state level 
And I think it was the 85th legislature where we finally convinced them, starting with us here at yep. Delmar College. You remember that conversation? They, where we asked them to lower the age of students eligible to participate in continuing education adult uh, ed funded classes. And we lowered it to the post sophomore year in high school or 16 years old, where it was 18 before. We, th we argued that it should go down to the, to the, to the freshman level I would argue even younger, uh, even younger, and so we absolutely agree with you, and, and, and that's, a, that's a continued conversation that might be, might be uh, tacked on and even hammered on to it with rules making or something in the future with, with, with the work of the commission. I tried to bring it up, but I didn't want to distract too much from, from, the, from the greater work of, of funding and, and so forth, but we're, we're, we're absolutely in agreement that the younger and younger I have a question on the funding thing too. So, I mean, we, we have a set $100 rate for dual credit. Uh, that was basically a decision made to make sure that they were affordable for everybody. Um, and my understanding is that's kind of a, I guess, a loss leader or marketing expense for us. You know, we, we lose a little bit of money on what those really cost. Um, if the state's going to pick up a substantial tab, have we done any math on looking at that? To, uh, <laughs> so they're, they're not picking up the tab. They're, there's going to be scholarship money available, need-based for dual credit students. Right. We will also, we have in the past gotten contact hour funding for those dual credit students. We will now get outcomes-based funding for dual credit completion uh, within within some guardrails. It's not going to be random act of dual credit, but yeah. you know, within some guardrails uh, for for those students. So they're not picking up 100% of the tab, but they are. There will be need based scholarship available. Right. Well, I, mean, I guess that they're saying they will pay whatever our tuition is. Are they saying they'll pay like our hundred dollar tuition or what our normal tuition would be for a class like that? <laughs> <laughs> so so those rules are being hammered out that's a, that's the okay. exact question that i took to them last week and um they're still working on that and what they're saying is so far is that when the coordinating board comes up with a price when uh, an agreed upon price for, for 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 maximum that if you don't charge more than then you can assess a charge in addition to did i miss that so they, they didn't want us raising our prices. Right. But the, so they are going to set a maximum price statewide is what I understand. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. that will, there will be scholarships available for students up to that maximum amount. If you agree, if you, if you char decide to charge more, you're not required to charge yeah. less than the maximum price that they set. Right. They, you're, but the scholarship monies will not be available be to available. you if you charge more than the maximum price. Okay. The bottom line is I think that there will be more for the students um, that, that need the access the most, that need the, the, right. the assistance the most. That's the that's the the whole idea behind it. And I think we are definitely going to be much better off financially as we are now. I'm already looking at some scenarios. I haven't crunched the numbers with the business office just yet, but we'll talk about. We have a meeting this week, Roll and I, and so I have a scenario where we where we need to um, manipulate the variables and see what costs uh, could be like um, based on those scenarios both and then and then there's considerations for in district and out of district as well and what are we doing there to to make make this whole thing balance out i, I mean it's not that i want to charge people more but i think like i think we have an opportunity with this bill to make a college education available to a lot more people and i don't want us undercharging it to limit how many people we can reach if we can like figure out a way to break even on the whole thing where you know we can basically tell everybody we'll do as much as the, of this as we can yeah. that's being hammered out that's there's yeah. not a firm answer just yet there are some basic ideas and rules as, as chair scott and i've shown um, but uh, stay tuned because that was the first question that i called as soon as i got hba that was the first question i called about to say what is everybody else doing? And everybody's kind of scrambling right now until we've got some more solid okay. answers. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Well, the takeaway for, for me yeah. in this is that we want to have a really robust discussion at the visioning retreat and throughout the next several sessions as we talk about this environment for strategic planning, that we really understand 
where our opportunities are, where our challenges and obstacles are, uh, and that we are really kind of digging in and understanding the data and how we're going to measure our success going forward. So I think I think you've got a, a board that's going to be highly engaged in that piece of it. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for listening today. Appreciate the, the opportunity to, to give a little entry here. Let's see if you want to move it forward. I'll the end. Thank you. There. Now Mary McQueen is going to give Thank us you. our legislative update. Y'all getting a bunch of meaty topics today. Uh, let's see. All right, so this is going to be kind of what you're looking at each um, month that we do this update. First session, the last day to file a bill, by the way, will be this Friday. And the last day of the session is the 29th currently. Um, this is an update as of this morning. We currently have 5,429 bills. Of course, nothing is passed. Nothing can be voted on until after all bills are filed on March 10th. So this is the report as of uh, the 7th today. We are currently monitoring, and I've updated these numbers as of March 1st. We're currently monitoring 451 bills. Of those in level one are 69. We have 81 in level two, 164 in level three, and 137 in level four. I spend most of my time looking at level one and trying to delve into those, and, and then we move further down. Currently, what we're looking at, um, obviously, is the appropriations, SB1 and House Bill 1. That's the appropriation bill. Also, the TACCF bill in the House, House Bill 8, uh, came out um, under Van Dever. So we have that piece to start looking at. We do not have the companion bill from the Senate yet, but that's the piece that supports the Texas Commission on Community College Finance and re-looking at how we do community college finance. Currently, I'm looking at about five bills that are tuition and financial aid, 11 that deal with property tax and appraisals, 11 that deal with, uh, I'm sorry, let me update these numbers, um, eight, there are eight with tuition and financial aid. There are 10 with property tax. I pulled one out because it really didn't apply to us. There are 12 right now with cyber and IT issues, 15 with curriculum or dual credit issues, and then of course SB 458, which is nurse education. I think we had a hearing on that this week, um, and that is about protecting um, community college um, access to clinical uh, for community colleges and, in fact, any uh, public education because there's a, a core of for-profit for nurse education that are coming in and trying to use up some of the um, um, clinical space, which, of course, is very challenging because that's a big piece of what we need to do. So in your packet, I've provided each one of you a packet. And in it, it has the, the focus for the legislative session. This is a packet that we give to our legislators when we go up. So it has the priority of the focus. I'm not gonna go all over all of them, but I'll answer any questions on any component of it. You'll see clinical nursing sites is a big part of that. And the Texas, uh, Texas transfer framework is a big part of it. But this is the overall uh, legislative session priority focus for the Texas Association of Community Colleges and the trustee component also. The next piece is your Texas Commission on Community College Finance, and these are basically the, the components of the recommendations. Um, so this is what we have, and again, we give it out every time we go, even though they may, or may already have three copies. We're making sure that they get it each time because we want our talking points out there. So it's a, it's a great piece, but the recommendations, particularly for the new trustees. I wanted to make sure that you had these recommendations in front of you, but this is the piece that Dr. Escamilla, Regent Scott, and myself are going out and talking to the legislators about. So here's the different pieces. And again, I'll answer any questions on those. 
The actual funding recommendations are $430 million for outcomes base, affordability for students, $170 million. These are for bienniums. And investment in college capacity, $50 million. Wanted you to make sure that you had those numbers there, that $650 million per biennium. Um, both House Bill 1 and, House, and Senate Bill 1 have that funding in the base budget as of right now, and I think there's been some, some updated in that, that language that, I, that okay. probably needs to be looked at. And then, of course, we have uh, House Bill 8 has supporting legislation for this. The reason is important, and this is a piece that's also in, because this is a lot of the information on why it is so important that we take a look and re- configure how we do community college financing because 43% of all Texas post-secondary students are in community colleges. 93% of all career and technical education degrees are awarded through community colleges. And what would, did we just notice? We need those degrees. Well, that's 93% through community colleges. 92% of all dual credit enrollments in Texas are through community colleges. So getting a reimbursement on dual credit is going to be very important. 68% of all Texas freshmen and sophomores are community college students. 70% of all community, um, all minority freshmen and sophomore in higher education are community college. That could be because we're a third the cost. And it makes good sense. And 44% of Texas credentials awarding to economically disadvantaged students, they're coming through community colleges. So the reason, these are some of the key reasons we need to look at refocusing how we do community college finance to make sure that we're supporting those institutions that are fueling our economy by training our local citizens. Texas ranks the top five in the nation for affordability. I, you can see the numbers there. Community college students have less debt. At 28% of students graduate with $15,000 in debt, and public university students, 56% graduate with $25,000 in debt. Obviously, it's a huge benefit to get, particularly the first two years, if not your associate's degree and your technical programs through Del Mar College or another community college. And that's kind of the overview. And now I can answer any questions you may have. Do we have any questions for Mary? I don't have a question, but I have a request. Uh, yes, and call to your attention, uh, Regents, the pocket profile. Uh, this is a brand new publication. Just came out in the last month, less than that. Yes. So to appreciate a handful. Uh, you got it. Every Regent should have a handful. Keep it in your suit pocket. Keep it in your car. Keep it beside your desk. It's a, hand, it's a handy dandy little quick answer when somebody goes, how much, how many? And you say, hold please, let me look at my pocket profile. I will make sure to have a handful ready for the next Regents meeting. Thank you for your attention. I, I have one question. Um, is there a Senate corollary to HB 8 yet? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Okay. But we're not expecting, I, I assume we're expecting one that oh, we is absolutely, identical? We okay. absolutely are expecting one. We have had a lot of of support through the um, Senate Finance Committee. It just hasn't been, it hasn't got out of, it hasn't been filed yet. So okay. I think we're looking at Creighton. Still Creighton still looking at doing that one? May, we think so. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Hang on tight. Uh, we were just talking about that a little while ago. When what version it's going to come and what, 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 uh, what source it's going to come from, we're not sure yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a, do you have any and I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's a, um awful thing if there's not a Senate companion bill. That just means that HB 8 would go over as the enabling legislation and it would still go through education on the Senate side. And so I don't, I don't think that's a, um, don't read anything into it that's not there other than it took a long time for this bill to get out of ledge council because it's pretty complicated. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I think that is. that may be the only indication why that they worked on one version, even though the other should be an exact duplication. So. Yeah, it could be they're like, okay, that one's good. Let's, yeah. right. okay, yeah, all right. All right. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Nice job, thank you, Mary. I think that is a good question though to ask because I think the only difference is if a House bill is passed and a companion has not ever been heard in, this, in a Senate committee and vice versa. I think there are rules as to when something can go through. So Mary, that might be a good question. Mary? 
That might be a good question to ask Jacob if there's any concern there because of the way the, the rules around original legislation and has something had a hearing, had its first hearing or not. So that would be the only reason to have a companion bill. Anything else? Moving on, we're gonna talk about property tax collections. Mr. Garcia. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we continue our budget planning process with today's discussion on property taxes, uh, which is the largest of the college's three major revenue streams. Our reported 2022 property tax revenue is $60.6 .6 million, and it represents 56% of the college's annual operating revenues. Because our property tax revenue is dependent on our district's property valuations, uh, today's property tax collection assessment presentation will include information about the district's real estate market, property tax collections, and other matters that may affect the college's estimated tax revenue for the 2024 budget plan. So before we take a deep dive on the district housing uh, market activity, I wanted to provide some context about the district's property valuations by category. There are nine property categories reported by the Nueces County Appraisal District. For simplicity purpose, I have summarized uh, their information into seven categories. Please note the district's property valuations is heavily weighted on single family homes at a rate of 40% of the district's total valuation. While the industry and commercial properties are a distant second and third respectively. Based on the Nueces County Appraisal District certified appraisal role, the district property valuation scaled up from 336.1 billion to 44.5 billion during the four year period ending 2022, with a year over year record increase of 5.1 million or 12.9%. Because the property valuations are heavily weighted on single family homes, the next slide uh, includes trending real estate market activity for single family homes. Are there any questions? Uh, I, I have a question on the uh, percentage on the collection rate. Is that based on what their certified tax roll, or I'm sorry, are, I can wait until you get to that slide. I, I, Okay, never mind. So, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I ask for your patience. Thank you. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> good, good. At least I know we have uh, some interest. Thank you. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, so, um, Single family housing in our district has performed extremely well through the third quarter of 2022, when the reporting closing price for single family homes peaked in August at $301,000. Uh, again, this is for the medium um, uh, uh, price of, of uh, single family homes. This is noted in blue uh, of the trend line on this chart. The number of days a house stayed on the market hit a low in June of uh, of June of this year, this past year of 72 two days. Uh, this is highlighted in gray, it's the gray line on the chart. So in recent months, the district has been experiencing a slowdown in real estate activity for single family homes. This is pro uh, partially attributed to the increase in the cost of finance that started around the time the Federal Reserve began to increase the Fed fund rate to rein in inflation. The first of multiple Fed fund raises increases started in the first quarter of 2022. Subsequently, the 30-year fixed mortgage rate, as reported by Freddie Mac, reached a record high in October 2022 at a rate of 7.1% from the previous 12 months low rate of 3.1%. This is highlighted in yellow on the chart. It is around the same time the district begins to experience a slowdown of activity in single family home single family home market. Based on the market reports issued by Tamu Real Estate Research Center, the median price for single family homes trended downward in January 2023 to 266,000 from the August 2022 high of 301,000. This is noted uh, in blue on the trend line of this graph. And the recently reported uh, low, uh, this and this recently reported low has dropped below the median price reported from the previous 12 months 
of 276,000. Next is the gray trend line on this graph. It is now taking longer to sell a house. The average number of days uh, a, a house is on the market, uh, reported for the January 2023 period, has scaled up to 117 days from June's 2022 low of 72 days. The next data point is in orange, uh, on the orange trend line of this graph. The number of new single family permits issued by the city of Corpus Christi scaled down in January of 2023 to 30 uh, permits down from its peak of June 2022 of 127 permits. This recently reported low has dropped below the 120 permits that were issued in the preceding 12 months. If recent increases in the cost of finance, financing is partially driven by changes in monetary uh, policy, it is, uh, is indicative of today's slowdown of activity in the real estate market, it would appear further changes in the cost of financing will reduce the real estate uh, market activity in our district as the Fed continue to rein in high inflation with changes in the Fed fund rate. This is a big unknown for the college. We really don't know what direction the economy is gonna go, what the Fed's going to do. So this is now causing a heightened level of uncertainty for the college when estimating today's property tax revenue as we continue to plan for the 2024 budget year. The property tax revenue estimate will be more definitive sometime in July when the college expects to receive the certified appraisal role from the Nueces and San Patricio appraisal districts. If there are no questions, Mr. Johnson will now go over trending property tax collections. Great, thank you. I suspect I'll have a question from Mr. Loeb. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this slide shows a comparison of property tax collection rates on the adjusted current tax levy as of January 31st, as reported by the Nueces County Tax Assessor Collector. The 2023 collection rate of 69.3% on the far right is within range, which historically is a good indicator that collections will closely resemble budgetary projections. When the collection rate falls below 67% during the same period as was seen in year 21, the college can anticipate a loss of revenue. As you might gather, collections were greatly affected by the pandemic. During this fisc that particular fiscal year, lost revenue exceeded $1 million. Are there any questions? So this is my question. Um, so that percentage is a percentage of their estimated uh, levy or their their certified role, right? Correct. They start out with a certified role and then they make adjustments as the year go along. So this is their adjusted levy. So what I heard happen last year is they had so many appeals that they kind of, in previous years, the certified role was all the appeals are done or other than what what's going to lawsuits. And this last year, they were still running appeals for several months afterwards. Correct. So how did they do a certified role with people who were appealing afterwards? And have they gone back and looked at the certified role versus what they resolved after that? Well, they're, they're still doing appeals currently. Um, my discussion with uh, Mr. Canales um, during this last week, there are still a significant number of um, companies that are on appeal. Um, they normally, what will happen is they'll pay on their appraised value to forego any penalty or interest that they might incur at a later date. But that doesn't mean their appeal has, in, in essence, ended because they can go in through, through litigation and at, at, at a later period of time, we'd end up in a refunding issue. Okay, so that 69% includes if somebody 
went through ARB, wasn't satisfied, filed the lawsuit, paid it, right? But they're Correct. contesting a portion of it. They may be contesting a okay. portion of it. So Are we may. <laughs> it's not unusual for us to make refunds all during the entire year. Okay. Um, do we have any data on how much is uh, being appealed compared to previous years? I don't have that information in front of me okay. um, right now. I know that there's a significant number that are on appeal, but nothing that compares to last year. Okay. Last year was, was uh, since I've been keeping data, for about 27 years now, that was the largest year that they had um, the the number of appeals that were submitted. Yeah, I and, and so I mean I, I saw this and I kept hearing oh there's no problem and I'm, I'm like that's not what I'm hearing from other people and how many right. random people called me. So I, I think we'll talk more in exec session about it. But okay, okay, thank you. I just wanted to understand what that slide was. Are there any other questions? Um, as indicated, there's, there are two major petrochemical companies which are protesting and have filed lawsuits contesting their valuations for year 2018 through 2022. The college uh, continues to, uh, to remain in close contact with the appraisal district to stay, stay up, uh, apprised of any changes or discussions held between the entities. No timelines can be projected as to when a judgment will be reached and any monetary impact on the college cannot be determined. Are there any questions? I don't see if any not. more. Thank you. I'd, I'd, I'd just say, I, I think given how this is, and unless the state does something where they really clean this up, which they might, I think we need to start tracking how much aggregate is being appealed every year. So because I'm not sure that that slide really tells us what our liability is. It just tells how good Kevin was at collecting, not necessarily how much we might have to give back. So. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Garcia, any other mini wrap-up comments? No, that just concludes our presentations. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we have our pending business list uh, in the packet today. Uh, in uh, April and May, we will see a uh, strategic enrollment management report, our quarterly financial and investment report, and a HERF update. I don't know if that's going to be close to a HERF final report, Mr. Garcia, or in May. Is that a final? Probably not. It'd be pretty close. Yes, that's, that's the vision. I, I think we were at the tail end of spending most of our dollars and we're just waiting from some data um, uh, from, uh, from the perspective of the financial system provided to our students. I think we may have one more initiative that we're talking about and so uh, would like to embed that in the final presentation so if everything works well, uh, I think uh, May could be a good targeted month for a presentation good. for now. Thank you. Yeah, more to come. HERF is Higher Education Emergency Relief Funds. I can't remember SAC COC, but I can remember that. <laughs> uh, and then we, uh, our board annual self-evaluation. So this is TBD because we're having the conversation on what is helpful for our April uh, visioning retreat. Uh, and with three new board members is right now the the right time to do a board self-evaluation. Could we do part of it now and part of it later? Could there be a replication? So Libby and I are having some discussions about what's the actual right timing to do the annual self-evaluation. By our bylaws, that's done annually. Uh, SAC COC accreditation um, suggests annually or biennially. So we do have some flexibility from a, a, an accreditation standpoint. We just need to determine what's kind of the best time frame for us. And then in June, we'll do our, uh, have another internal audit report, uh, our uh, semi-annual professional contract review, um, and then you see this stuff for the rest of the year. Any questions on our pending item list? Moving on to our consent agenda, we have three items under consent agenda, uh, approval of minutes, acceptance of investment and financial data, 
Uh, is there anything that needs to be pulled for separate consideration? Uh, I make a motion that we approve all items on the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Krull. Second by uh, Mr. Loeb. Did I hear that correctly? By Dr. Babley. I'm sorry. I saw I saw movement, and I wasn't sure who. So Dr. Babley made a second that motion. Any uh, questions or comments on that motion? Is there any public comment on the consent agenda items? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. That motion passes. We have one regular agenda item, Mr. Strabos and Mr. Rivera. Regents, let me set it up really quickly, uh, and then I'll let Mr. Strabos get into the details. Section 130.066 of the Texas Education Code gives uh, public junior colleges or community colleges in Texas the right to automatically annex any property that's annexed by a municipality or a school district that is wholly within the boundaries of the community college. Uh, back in 1983, the Delmar Community College uh, took in all of the boundaries of the city of Corpus Christi and since then has had this right to automatic annexation. What that means is all you have to do is order it. You don't have to put it up for vote or do anything else other than do it at a public meeting. Uh, and so that's, that's the basic law. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Stribos to give you the details of what's before you this afternoon. Thank you, Augie. On December 20, 2022, the city of Corpus Christi passed an ordinance annexing the section of County Road 43 and County Road 18, located south of Farm to Market 2444. It's being approximately 9.78 acres, annexing, annexing approximately 37.44 acres of land per the owner petition, and annexing a section of FM 2444 from County Road 41 to County Road 47 into the territorial limits of the city of Corpus Christi, and approving related surface plans. And that's come straight from the city, so if that sounds confusing, uh, that's straight off the city website. Um, the property is located in the London Independent School District boundaries. The proposed Caroline Heights subdivision project will consist of 37.44 acres, subdivided into 28 residential lots. The build out is proposed to take four to five years with an average home size of 2,500 square feet. The average lot price is proposed to be $210,000 to $260,000, with an estimated average sales price of $600,000. At full build out, this is an estimated property value of almost $17 million. And the property is currently zoned as agricultural open land with an appraised value of about $19,000. Uh, we're recommending proceeding with this annexation. Is there any questions for Mr. Stribos or Mr. Rivera? Well, being new to the board, um, have the other, the city's annexed some other areas out in the London area. Were those annexed as we went along? Yes. Okay. All right, um, the city's got on their agenda for this week or next week to annex another 141 acres uh, in the London area. Uh, so he'll, you'll be coming back with an item for that? Yes, sir, after the city appro right. uh, approves their annexation. I guess my next question is, has there been any discussion with London ISD about them being Come part of the Del Mar. So I I had lunch with the superintendent. Uh, I guess it was back in December. I think Miss Delia does that does that ring a bell? Was it back in December when I met with Dr. Whitus? And so we were catching up on a lot of a lot of uh, different issues. I guess the short answer is. We talked about what it could what it could look like. We didn't talk about the steps going in that direction, other than that because of these annexations and so forth, and the, the kind of the the growth in that area. Um, section by section is all we just acknowledged, and so you know, yeah, the implication was there, but we have not sat down and formally uh, discussed this. Okay, well, I get the impression that the city's philosophy on annexations in this area is changed and there's going to be a lot more of these spot annexations in this area if you will and the, the concern that i would have is you're going to end up with students who are in the london school district who are taking classes at del mar and one of them may be sitting next to another one and he's paying in-state in in-district tuition and his neighbor is paying 
out of district tuition. It's true. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to solve that problem, but let me ask for clarification. So, so London ISD, uh, as as an ISD boundaries are in our service area, but not our taxing district. Correct. Right. And so. This, if we're talking dual credit students, what is that tuition difference versus a uh, in an on-campus or a or Del Mar College full-time student? Could you explain the difference between those yeah. two categories of students? Yeah, so dual credit students, whether they're in district or out of district, all pay the $99.99. .99. But you're talking about, I think, you're talking about the students that are post secondary and living perhaps in district or out of district. So if you live in that little red square, or other other areas that fall within the municipality of Corpus Christi, then you're paying in district and, and, and otherwise. But you could still fall in the same school district, um, but not necessarily the same uh, college district boundaries, right. uh, taxing areas. So it's really post-secondary that the issue would, would, would arise after high school. You know, um, but, but the question remains, about bringing uh, about a, a a school district such as London coming in, and that's a big, broad conversation uh, for all of the taxing or all the residents of that taxing area to, to vote themselves in. Well, I, I just like I said, the city's philosophy appears to be that when they can go out and grab an area. Uh, you know, the, their annexation powers have been severely limited by the state legislature, but they can annex along county road boundaries and state highways, assuming that TxDOT would approve the annexation. So they're, they're trying to reach out and grab all of these little developments as they occur. And uh, I think that's gonna continue. And then, so you're gonna end up with you know this piece in and this piece out and you know it's going to end up being an issue somewhere down the line yeah well i i think at some point i mean i don't know how successful they've been doing it at getting certain neighborhoods and some but i mean given the dynamics of that that district there's going to be a point where I don't know, we may have already hit it, where a majority of the population may already live in our college district and we just don't know it. So, I mean, I think that might be something to explore is, you know, is there is there a point where so much of that ISD is in the district, both in terms of value, that it makes more sense to just talk to them about, well, hey, why don't we annex this, all the district? But this district goes, the London ISD district goes way west. Yeah. And it covers a lot of undeveloped area. Uh, and but just inside of State Highway 286, I would think that within the next couple of years, it's probably going to be 50-50. So I don't think there has to be a sense of urgency about this, but potentially the next time that we have this discussion, let's have a clear map or um, uh, documentation of within that area what what constitutes the current Del Mar Ta College taxing district and what is out of our taxing district. So, so this, I mean, this sounds like a perfect, you know, next board meeting or mm -hmm. soon to be board meeting agenda item. Well, you'll, there'll be an agenda item coming up pretty quickly about the 141 acres. We'll tie those two together. I mean, and the city should have some pretty good data on how many people live in city well, Not necessarily, you know, I mean, these, these annexations, you know, like this one, you, this is like a five-year build-out, but some yeah, of the I, others that some of the um, more aggressive developers and builders have, or their build-out is going to be a lot quicker. Yeah. All right. Any other questions for um, Mr. Stribus on this particular action item? We do have a uh, uh, the motion. We have a potential for a motion to uh, annex the uh, City of Corpus Christi property as described in the memorandum. Is there a motion to that so effect? So moved. Thank you, Second. David. <laughs> Second by Mr. Cruel. Boy, you guys are fast. <laughs> my, my ears can't hear that fast. What about Any you know, other questions or comments on that motion? Is there any public comment on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. 
Any opposed, same sign. That, message, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Madam Regent. And by memorandum, you meant the order that was distributed. Yes, I'm yeah. so sorry, yes. Yeah. Got it, thank you. As described, yes. Um, we are now going to enter into closed session under Texas Government Code 551.074 regarding the appointment of employment evaluation reassignment duties as a plans or dismissal of public officer employee with possible discussion and action in open session and or Texas Government Code 551.071 regarding pending or contemplated litigation or settlement offer with possible discussion and action open session and the seeking of legal advice from counsel on pending legal or contemplated matters or claims with possible discussion and action in open session. The time is 2.49 p.m. We will take just a quick five-minute break to clear the room. Ladies and gentlemen, we have returned from closed session at 3.23 p.m. There is no action coming out of closed session today. Uh, next item on our agenda would be to look at our calendar for the coming month. Um, we want to uh, wish all of our faculty and staff and students a wonderful spring break next week. Uh, for those of you who don't have to work on your holiday, good for you. Enjoy your time off somewhere. For those of you that do have to work on your holiday, so sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, and we're going to come back and have DMC Day at the Capitol on March 22nd. Uh, our board meeting in April will be on the 11th. And then also in April, we will have our Oso Creek Grand Opening at 10 a.m. on Friday the 21st. And the board is going to have a visioning retreat uh, on the 28th with, I think, dinner the night before. That's what we're planning on right now. In May, uh, put on your calendars as an optional event if you can attend our service awards uh, for uh, 5, 10, 15, 25. We actually have a couple of 45-year employees who are going to be receiving their service awards, so it's going to be a, a special day. And then a board meeting on May 9th and uh, a board development retreat on the 18th and then graduation on the 19th. For those new regents uh, who've not participated in graduation yet, we, uh, you attend if you can. Let, uh, let Delia know if you need help with regalia. We do wear our regalia. Uh, for those of us that don't own it, uh, Delia provides it for us. But if you own it, then you're welcome to, to wear your own. Uh, and we get a chance to look, look in the eye and shake the hands of our graduates as they're coming through uh, on their great graduation. Anything I have missed? Sir, all right, anything else for the good of the cause? Seeing nothing else, we are adjourned at 3.23 p.m. Excuse me, 3.25 p.m. <laughs>